Hello, everyone. So my name is Annabella Maguedes. I'm a nephrologist in Algarve, Portugal, and it is my pleasure and a privilege to moderate this webinar today with our esteemed panelists on the position paper on assisted PD, published last month on Prisoner Dialysis International. I want to remind everybody that this is an ISN ISPD joint webinar. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please make sure to put them in the question and answer section of the Zoom area. So to get things off, I am going to introduce our first speaker. That's Dr. Matthew Oliver. Dr. Matthew Oliver is the lead author of the Assisted Paternal Dialysis Position Paper for the ISPD. He is currently an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and Division Head of Nephrology at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. He is the former President of the North American Chapter of the International Society of Paternal Dialysis and the co-principal investigation of the North American PD catheter registry. Dr. Oliver, we all look so forward to your presentation on justification barriers for PD. Thank you very much, Annabella. Here are the declarations for the group. And this is the overall objectives for the webinar today, which is to define and justify the need for assisted PD, to describe training of assistance and key aspects of delivering assisted PD, to describe outcomes and costs associated with assisted PD, and then finally to discuss some strategies to advocate for assisted PD. So there was a lot of discussion early on in the position statement of how what, what should be included and what not be included in the definition, and we decided to focus on assisted PD that was delivered and funded through the healthcare system. Um, we acknowledge that there's many forms of assistance, including friends and family members, which is critical for PD, but we really wanted to advocate for the specific type of assisted PD, which would be funded. Um, there are different types of people providing assistance, including healthcare professionals, trained lay people, and family members in some instances that are paid by the, the healthcare system, not just family members that are unpaid in assisting uh, people on PD, which is, of course, very common. And we're also focusing on assistance provided in a patient's residence or in other institutions, as long as the assistant is visiting um, that institution. We didn't want to include um, PD, which is assisted from staff, say, in a long-term care facility. We felt that was uh, out of scope. So specifically, we excluded unpaid family members or friends. Uh, as, as part of this, we're not saying this isn't a form of assistance P, assisted PD. We're saying this is out of scope for the position statement. Uh, we also wanted to exclude private caregivers or domestic workers paid by the patient or the family. And as I mentioned, assistance provided by staff in an institution such as a long-term care facility. Um, this is a framework we developed many years ago for looking at who is eligible for PD. And I bring it up just so we sort of frame the idea of self-care barriers. So first of all, if you, if you systematically evaluate all people starting dialysis, you will identify a certain number of people who have contraindications to PD, uh, usually around 20%. Contraindications are defined by sort of the interdisciplinary team that's evaluating them, and they will vary site by site. But a medical contraindication could be something like active inflammatory bowel disease. A social contraindication could be the patient resides in a say a residence which does not permit PD. Um, but then when you're, th so the 80% remaining, um, if you can evaluate them for self-care barriers to PD, and we're gonna list those in the next slide, but self-care barriers are not contraindications, they're just conditions which could make PD more challenging. And the reason they're important is that they're modified by the availability of support. If somebody doesn't have support, a barrier could be, uh, could make it so they're not eligible. Uh, but if they do have support, then, the, then it can be overcome and they still may, may be eligible. And then you're left at the end with the percentage of people who are eligible for PD. In a typical program, that uh, would be around 70 to 80 percent of all people starting PD. So in terms of common barriers to PD, they're listed here in the table. And these barriers were developed through uh, interdisciplinary assessments of consecutive uh, patients starting dialysis. Um, we did studies with hundreds of patients across Canada in different centers, and these are the typical things that come up when, this, when the team evaluates someone for assisted PD. Physical barriers are very common, acuity, dexterity, strength. Cognitive barrier, bar barriers are very common. People may have established conditions such as dementia, but they may just have other things like memory difficulties, anxiety, difficulty understanding instructions. Um, so those are important. 
And there are a few sort of behavioral ones where there's concerns about compliance or adherence where additional supervision or assistance could be beneficial. Now, when we systematically evaluated these people, um, of the people who did not have a contraindication, 63% had at least one self-care barrier listed in this table. So if you evaluate people carefully, you'll find that self-care barriers are extremely common. This is a study where we evaluated people who are 50 years or older um, at the time of PD training. And we didn't just do an interdisciplinary team assessment for barriers. We actually did um, standardized um, validated geriatric assessments. So these are tools which can be used to identify other difficulties with self-care. And you can see here what it shows is that when you do a, a, a more formal tool, the, the prevalence again of functional impairment you can see up to 80%, up to 80 out of 120 patients. Cognitive impairment, very common. Frail or pre-frail, very common. And then, you know, combinations of them are very common. So whether you do self-care barriers informally by your team, or you do formal geriatric assessments, you're going to find barriers to self-care are extremely common. The other thing that we then looked and followed these patients and found out who was assisting them in the home in an environment where home care was available and this is what the red bars show is that these are the patients that were being getting nursing support here in the blue bars are family support and then the green is self care and this is a common theme as well is that you know there's a combination of family support going on along with nursing support um, with assisted pd so assisted pd is in some ways a supplement to both the patient and the family there are specific instances where assisted pd can be helpful one is during initiation to ensure safety and build confidence. Some people are, are quite capable of self-care, but they lack confidence. And so assisted PD can be brought to the home to bring, give them that extra safety barrier. And then assisted PD is withdrawn once confidence is built. There are, of course, periods where patients or, or caregivers can have illnesses or burnout. And then bringing assisted PD into the home can be very effective. Another element is that patients can have cognitive or physical decline over time. So even though they started on self-care, they have to have assistance P, assisted PD to main, be maintained on PD. And I think there's a lot of focus on the elderly because they often have self-care barriers, but we wanted to also emphasize, you know, thinking about younger individuals that have disabilities that may also benefit from assisted PD. And one of the points was brought up is that some of these patients may have difficulty receiving dialysis in a congregate setting where that's very noisy and busy, such as an in-center hemodialysis unit. So having care at home for those patients uh, is very helpful. And finally, last but certainly not least, we know that the risk of COVID-19 was lower in home dialysis patients than in, than in in-center patients. So having more people at home could potentially reduce the risk of transmissible, transmissible infection. So the recommendations for this section is that all patients um, considering uh, or considering choosing PD should undergo an interdisciplinary assessment. I think this is likely happening in most programs uh, by a team to identify physical, cognitive, emotional, and social barriers to PD that may be overcome. Whether you need to do formal geriatric assessments or not is, a, is, is controversial, but those things could also assist in identifying patients objectively. Caregivers that also should be assessed because they're critical for supporting PD in the home. And then self-care patients and family-assisted patients should be monitored on a regular basis. So if those new barriers, um, uh, if those new barriers become prevalent, that assisted PD can be implemented in a timely way so the patients don't uh, have a failure of PD at home. Um, caregivers should be monitored as well uh, because assisted PD can reduce uh, burden of care in caregivers. And finally, um, coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think assisted PD can also be positioned as a strategy to reduce transmissible infection by allowing more people to be treated in the home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliver, for your excellent presentation. And I would just like to remember everybody that we are readdressing the questions at the end of the talks. So moving forward, our second team speaker is Dr. Clemence Bechard. She's a nephrologist of the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Cayenne in charge of proton dialysis program with Professor Thierry Logde. She's an active member of the French Proton Dialysis Registry and Reine Registry. She's a senior lecturer of the University of Cayenne since uh, 2021. 
Dr. Bashad, we uh, very look much forward for your presentation on outcomes and cost effectiveness. Thank you, Annabella, and good day to everyone. Thank you, Matthew, for your nice presentation. Thank you to all the group involved in this uh, position paper. So I will um, talk about results and outcomes of assisted PD. Um, to make this presentation, we will uh, focus on three different parts. First, we will um, see at the patient's level uh, what are the results of um, assisted PD, so what are the outcomes of patients treated by assisted PD. Secondly, at the center level, we will define the concept of continuous uh, quality improvement. And finally, at the healthcare system level, we will um, I will give you some uh, feedbacks of uh, what we can expect uh, at the healthcare system level when assisted PD programs are um, launched. So first of all, patients level, um, of course, peritonitis is uh, one big event of interest when we are looking for uh, peritoneal dialysis patients. Um, so here we have data from France where uh, we are lucky because we have assisted PD for uh, assisted PD programs uh, has been available for years. Um, and also because we have a, a, a national registry dedicated to PD, which is uh, called RDPLF. So we are able to show some of the outcomes associated with uh, assisted PD. So in that study, um, the objective was to see if uh, greater age was associated with an increased risk of uh, peritonitis. Um, and you can see that the first um, blue arrow of this uh, slide that age, uh, greater age was not associated with an incre increased risk of uh, peritonitis. Um, you can see also that uh, as nurse assistance is uh, very useful for um, our old patients on PD. Um, as you can see that 75% uh, seven, of uh, the patients uh, older than 75 uh, were uh, using nurse assistance. And that's the second arrow uh, on this slide. You can see that in multivariate analysis, uh, nurse assistance was associated with a lower risk of peritoneal infection. So that's um, an important uh, result. Um, another hard endpoint is technique survival. So the time spent on PD. Uh, here again, it's data from RDPLF and my colleague uh, Antoine Lano has uh, studied um, the risk of transfer to hemodialysis. <clears throat> and you can see here that the nurse assistance was associated with a lower risk of transfer to, to HD. Um, and in co-specific analysis, he showed that uh, uh, transfer to HD due to uh, peritonitis and transfer to HD due to um, lack of adequacy were more specifically associated um, um, that nurse assistance has a specific um, lower risk uh, of transfer to HD because of these two uh, complications, so peritonitis and lack of uh, adequacy. Um, now uh, we are moving to the risk of hospitalization. So here it's data coming from Matthew and uh, his team. Um, so they have um, evaluated the, the risk of hospitalization in uh, assisted PD patients and also in in-center hemodialysis uh, patients. Um, so of course, uh, an old and, and frail uh, patient treated at home by assisted PD uh, will meet the nephrologist um, every six to eight weeks, whereas an in-center hemodialysis patients will be able to meet the nephrologist um, three times a week. So we could have been afraid of um, an increased risk of hospitalization in case of assisted PD. But finally here you can see um, in that study that the mean number of days in hospital was not different, different between uh, uh, assisted PD and in-center hemo. Um, so there were similar rates of all-cause hospitalization uh, between uh, assisted PD and in-center HD uh, patients. 
And we are also, uh, of course, uh, interested by quality of life. So here it's data coming, coming from um, the UK where they have assessed um, quality of life and they have used several scales to um, evaluate this quality of, quality of life and also treatment satisfaction and disease uh, intrusiveness. Um, so again, it was a comparison between uh, um, assisted PD patients and in-center hemodialysis patients um, matched for uh, several covariates. Um, that study failed to uh, show any differences between um, um, these different items of quality of life uh, when comparing assisted PD patients to in-center hemodialysis. But it's important to note that it was also difficult to, um, to lead this uh, prospective study, um, including old and frail patients. So uh, only 80 uh, patients uh, were able to, uh, to do the follow-up of two years. Uh, so only 80 on the 200 patients uh, included in that study. Uh, so it's difficult to uh, perform such a study with old and frail patients, and it was difficult to show any difference uh, between the two groups uh, because of this low number of patients at the end of the, of the follow-up. And uh, the caregiver burden is also an important question, as we know that um, dialysis is associated with caregiver burden, and specifically home dialysis. So we have data showing that the caregiver burdens, uh, burden increases over time. Um, we don't have data on the precise impact of assisted PD on the caregiver burnout, but we have made recommendation in the position paper regarding uh, future research. Um, and we think that it's one uh, important uh, thing to, to study. So um, the recommendation we have made for future research in that section is to try to assess uh, the, the feasibility of measuring uh, patient reported outcome measurement in APD patients, and also uh, to study in the, in the future um, the, the impact of assisted PD on caregiver burden. Now, second part is at the center level. Uh, so here um, we, I will say that it's important to have a look to our results in each PD uh, center. Uh, so control, control quality improvement is um, defined as process for uh, involving people in planning um, and executing a continuous flow of improvement to provide quality health care that um, meets expectations. So that's the definition of uh, CQI. Um, the ISPD has uh, proposed several criteria to, to perform this CQI, and the SONG initiative has also uh, proposed to HAD PROMS. Um, so regarding uh, assisted PD, uh, the recommendation we have made in that position paper that um, PD programs should monitor assisted PD populations, of course, for outcomes similar to non-assisted population, and also um, to report outcomes uh, according to the use uh, of assistance. And regarding future research, maybe with, it would be um, useful to develop and validate um, quality measurements specific, specifically uh, dedicated to assisted PD. So for example, re reliability of uh, the assistant visit would be one cr criteria to evaluate more precisely uh, the uh, assisted PD program. Now at the healthcare system level, um, one question is, uh, is um, assisted PD pro are assisted PD programs able to increase the number of, uh, of uh, patients treated by PD? So here we have some uh, uh, input from several countries. Um, here it's data coming from France, where you can see that uh, assisted PD uh, has been reimbursed uh, in nursing homes in 2011. 
so um, the, 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 the nurse can uh, go inside the nursing homes to provide assisted PD to old and frail uh, patients. And you can see uh, on the right side that after this um, financial incentive, the, the use of nurse assisted PD has increased. Um, while on during the same period, the um, unpaid assisted PD has uh, really decreased. So that's a way to see that um, financial incentive and um, uh, the the increased availability of assisted PD can um, can promote uh, peritoneal dialysis. Um, here it's uh, data from Canada and uh, to it's data coming from Matthew Teams again. Uh, they have studied in Canada um, the eligibility for PD of patients treated in regions where um, home care is available and compared to regions where assistance is not available. Uh, so you can see that the eligibility for PD was higher in regions where um, assistance is available. And that's the blue bar. Um, and also that the number of patients finally treated by PD was higher in, the, in these uh, regions. So what, what we have mentioned in, in this uh, paper is that assisted PD can be promoted because it is associated with higher ins, incident, of PD, uh, incident PD use. And for future research, we think that it would be very important to uh, have a look to the precise impact of uh, assisted PD on PD uh, use in, in, in places and countries where it will become uh, available. Now, what about cost? Um, so is, is the assisted PD cost effective? Uh, of course, the cost of uh, assisted PD will depend from, will vary from one country to another. Uh, according to the type of assistant, to the number of visits per day, and also according to, to travel distances. So it's difficult to compare from one country to another. But of course, one important question is, is it, um, is it more or less expensive than uh, in-center hemodialysis? So here we have data from France, where the global cost of uh, each technique um, uh, has been evaluated. So the monthly global cost, including travel cost, um, nursing staff, and so on. And uh, you can see that uh, assisted PD was uh, less expensive than in-center hemodialysis. So um, it's uh, been studied in France, also in Canada, and it, in, some, in some places, and it's the same uh, conclusion. So we have mentioned that um, healthcare systems should fund models of assisted PD. So all patients who wish to receive PD but require assistance can have equitable access to PD. And we have written that uh, funding should support short-term and long-term assisted PD. And to answer the precise question of cost effectiveness, uh, it will require uh, specific studies with very dedicated methodology of uh, evaluation of cost effectiveness. And we think that it's uh, a proposition for uh, future research again. So uh, I, I hope that you're now uh, convinced that uh, we could have benefit uh, at the patient's level and also at the health healthcare system level um, when uh, launching assisted PD programs. So thank you for your attention. Thank you to all the group involved uh, in this uh, position paper. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Clemence Bechard. I am convinced. Thank you for your presentation. So let's advance with our next presentation. As we all are aware, the role of nurses is critical and nurses are the backbone of our PD programs. So our three, third esteemed speaker is nurse Janet Graham. She has held a wide variety of positions over her more than 30 year career at the Ottawa Hospital. And uh, some of these positions have included, besides nursing, roles supporting clinical research, advanced practice nursing, clinical director, and both regional and provincial director roles. Uh, 
She's currently the Regional Director of Nephrology at the Ottawa Hospital and the Chair of the Canadian Association of Nephrology Administrators. So let's listen to Nurse Janet Graham on the role of nurses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annabella, and thanks to the ISPD for this uh, honor to participate in this webinar. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience participating in, uh, in, in this position paper. Uh, so I'm going to speak to you today about what I think is a very important aspect, really, which is a selection uh, and training of assistants who will be delivering this very important uh, assisted PD to our patients. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the selection of the type of assistance really de depends on three, uh, three things. One, of course, is funding and the availability of that funding, which looks very different uh, in, uh, uh, in the jurisdictions across the world. Uh, but being able to leverage and, uh, and uh, access that funding is incredibly important and will help you uh, decide what type of nursing or type of assistance will be part of your program. The other uh, two, two uh, important elements really are what is the vision uh, for assisted PD uh, in your region or, or, or program. Um, you know, that really is dependent on what the scope of practice is with the type of assistance. And the other piece really is, is what is the realistic availability of those assistance within your areas. So in areas that are more rural and remote, uh, you know, certainly um, the availability of nurses may be quite uh, quite difficult, uh, depending on you know the economic situation of your your area as well. Uh, you know, assistance may be limited in where they can travel to and and what those modes of travel are. So there are a wide variety of options, everything from registered nurses, registered practical nurses, nursing assistants, non-registered uh, care providers, and in some places known as PSWs or in small uh, number of jurisdictions, there really are uh, some paid family members, but that is quite limited. Next slide, please. So training and education is pivotal. Uh, and I think one of the most important things is um, having standardized curriculums. Um, you know, I think those obviously need to be um, adapted to what the scope of practice and the design of what your assisted uh, PD program really looks like. But despite that, uh, there needs to be both the theoretical side so people understand, uh, you know, you know, the why for what, what they're doing uh, and the potential impact of the care that they're providing and giving them really that hands-on training uh, that is ever so important. So things like, you know, demonstrations and, and practice opportunities. There's lots of, uh, you know, virtual modules now. Uh, the pandemic has really helped us expand that opportunity. Making sure that people really understand the terminology. Uh, and that is very dependent on their background. But trying to standardize that term terminology so that there isn't, you know, confusion uh, among care providers. Um, you know, providing everything from the basic to the more advanced learning. I think we can make no assumptions. Um, you know, I think everyone needs to start from that, from ground zero, understand what the importance of things like hand hygiene are. And depending again on what model that you're looking for, things like, uh, you know, full physical assessments and, and the training behind that's incredibly important. I really, uh, you know, uh, promote shadowing opportunities uh, and ensuring that those can be included uh, where possible. And, you know, mentoring, this type of work can be quite isolating. So um, creating, um, you know, a model where there's a call a friend, um, you know, call your, um, you know, most reliable person to be able to provide the kind of information and answer the questions that you might have when you run across a unique situation while you're providing that care to patients. And the use of tools for reference and reminders. I think we underestimate, you know, the importance of things like checklists and, uh, you know, electronic uh, things uh, and tools that, that people can reference and go to, uh, you know, when they're out there in isolation and, and have come across something that they may not be, you know, as familiar with or, you know, have, may have forgotten. It, you know, it's, it can be uh, a bit challenging to stay on top of all of these things. And then ongoing education, which is an area we, we certainly, um, it falls uh, away uh, often with 
financial constraints and and the limitations and challenges that we can have um, just connecting with our, our teams, but reminding ourselves of the ongoing importance of that education, maintaining that competency and, and monitoring that. So um, I think one of the other pieces that I really do want to stress is the absolute importance and of uh, education being provided by trained educators. Um, so, you know, nurse educators in, in most jurisdictions, but I do understand that that can be limited or um, highly experienced uh, nurses that have that advanced knowledge of peritoneal dialysis uh, are incredibly important. So one of the other big challenges is really around staffing. Um, you know, we, we often underestimate um, the actual number of assistants that are needed so it, it can be difficult in this kind of environment to really estimate, you know, that total number of people that we need. But we need to look at things uh, like, you know, the size of our geographic area, taking into account all that time that it'll take to travel um, from home to home, from, the, the, you know, wherever that first point of contact is. Uh, and ensuring that we really understand our, um, you know, what specific uh, issues that there may be present within your workforce. Uh, things like absentee rates, uh, anticipated leaves. So, you know, uh, maternity leaves are of various lengths throughout the world uh, and in some areas can be extended as long as 18 months. Uh, so we really need to understand, you know, um, how many people we truly need, uh, what is our ability to actually recruit, and the real importance of uh, uh, you know, retention in all of our, um, you know, in all of our approaches. Uh, things like cross-training of staff um, across different areas can be extremely helpful. But with that, you have to ensure that they actually get enough time to actually um, hone their skills and be able to maintain those skills. You know, and we also need to consider what the scope and the expectations um, are of uh, very specific provider groups. So, you know, there's lots of opportunity within assisted PD to do everything from just very basic care to providing full physical assessments to reducing the number of times patients need to come to clinic and to be seen by other care providers. And, and nurses can provide, uh, you know, incredible amount of support in the community, um, particularly if they're given, you know, tools uh, electronically that they can, you know, um, connect with um, with their um, other providers uh, to do things like, you know, FaceTime and other things. And again, you know, incredibly important to um, ensure that all of your care providers um, understand what basic documentation uh, and communication uh, with patients and providers uh, really looks like and what the expect expectations are. Next slide, please. So I, I did mention competency. So competency monitoring is incredibly important. Uh, you know, it can look very different, but things from like annual uh, formal evaluations, um, some, you know, people promote, and I, I certainly think return demonstrations is incredibly important so that we're sure that people uh, haven't drifted from um, what we expect. Um, scheduled in-center learning opportunities, the value of being surrounded by other colleagues, physicians, nurses um, that have that experience, uh, it, you know, is um, incredibly valuable. Auditing, so things like putting this in the hands of uh, other care providers, peer-to-peer -peer audits, uh, again, um, documentation, uh, patient feedback and surveys, uh, taking that feedback that we get quite seriously and, um, you know, working with our individuals to improve, um, you know, in, in various areas or, you know, um, spread, you know, increase their scope uh, where, where possible. Uh, and in-home shadowing, you know, having, you know, leadership and um, supporting staff um, go out and uh, shadow our teams when they're out uh, visiting with patients is another way of really supporting and monitoring. Next slide, please. And I can't underestimate the importance of communication. So we need to establish very strong communication pathways using a variety of different tools, depending on what the resources are that are available. But we're talking about you know, communication that's between the assistant and the patient. So in things like case management models, those touch points with your patients is incredibly important. Uh, patient to assistant. So when the patients or family uh, need 
you know, have questions or concerns, being able to contact the assistants or leadership within that assistant pool. And then from the assistant to the care team, when they need to reach out, they've got questions or concerns. Oh. The minimum uh, documentation standards. So again, documentation is incredibly important. Sometimes we assume people actually know what we expect of them. Um, so making sure that that's very standardized. Things like transfer of accountability or assistant handover is really important, right? We're struggling, we're striving to have that continuity of care um, with our care providers. But you know, when that when there is that change, or um, whether it's day to day or you know in more longitudinal, making sure that we transfer the important information uh, from provider to provider, uh, and the use of tools to support communication, whether that's phones or you know, uh, other other things, to, depending on what the availability is in the specific uh, jurisdictions, having those regular touch points and, you know, care rounds uh, where we involve those providers in uh, and assistance in informing the rest of the care team on the progress of the patients. It's very engaging and, and very important, um, you know, again, for things like handover and awareness of other team members. Next slide, please. So just in summary, um, you know, our, the recommendations are that assistants should be trained by nurse educators or experienced PD nurses uh, with the program using a, a very standardized curriculum. Assistants should be trained for tasks appropriate to their skill level. Uh, that it's we have an adequate number of assistants, as I spoke to, and they should be available, the size adjusted for the population, accounting for geographic area with redundancies in place for staff absenteeism, and a robust communication system should be in place between the PD program and the assistant. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. So let's just move forward and our last speaker, is um, Dr. Graham Habra. He's clinical associate professor at, at Stanford University and served as the chief medical officer, home therapies at Satellite F Healthcare. His present clinical practice focuses on the care of patients with advanced chronic kidney diseases and management of home dialysis. Currently, he is the director of inpatient nephrology of Stanford Hospital, and he also serves as the moderator of the ASN HDU virtual longitudinal mentoring program and chairs of the Home Dialysis Academy of Excellence. Dr. Abra, we all look forward for your presentation on advocating for CCPD. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Malho, and uh, thank you to the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis and to my fantastic colleagues who uh, did an, a wonderful job in uh, setting us up for how we can advocate for assisted PD uh, for our patients. Um, uh, I have my declarations here, and I'll just begin us with some broad concepts around advocacy. So we as physicians or, or healthcare professionals more broadly, we, we have incredible advocacy power because we are the people in the room with patients who really understand many of the challenges and uh, things that patients, families, their caregivers go through when they're receiving care for end-stage kidney disease. And this is important for when we approach policymakers and others who might be involved in funding initiatives such as uh, assisted peritoneal dialysis. And as good advocates, it's on us to pay attention to our environment, to listen and read and uh, understand the th communications that are put out by our governments, by our insurance organizations, by societies that might relate to our ability to provide assisted PD to our patients. And we need to participate. We need to be active. It involved in local and national legislative uh, efforts, whether that be going to advocacy days or by joining committees and being uh, active and participating members in these things so that we are people who become trusted resources for people who are making decisions and might allow us to be able to fund important care initiatives. And I can't overemphasize how important it is to make personal connections 
when you are thinking about how to advocate for these things. It is very powerful to uh, make a personal connection with the person that you are talking with when you are trying to get something funded. Uh, it's also important to be visible, to be known, to be someone who is out there in a variety of different ways. And the power of uh, being someone who not only, of course, very importantly, uses facts and data when advocating, but also sharing your stories of how things like assisted PD or care, uh, self-care at home, peritoneal dialysis impacts patients and their families are incredibly uh, powerful when you're talking to important stakeholders. And seizing opportunities as they pop up to uh, engage with people who may be important in the decision-making process is really something that can be quite powerful. And this applies not just to physicians, as I mentioned, but to all of us as healthcare professionals who are part of the care teams that engage with our patients and their care partners on peritoneal dialysis. Now, more specifically, as you begin the thought process of how to advocate, think about who are the important stakeholders across the continuum of people who touch and involve themselves in the care of, of patients who are on PD. And you can see here sort of a brief summary of some of the big buckets um, uh, of stakeholders that are out there. And it crosses many different lanes, including the broader community of patients and families, the healthcare systems themselves and the people who work in them, governments and insurance organizations that often fund uh, 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 our healthcare, uh, private industry and those who are involved in uh, providing pharmaceuticals, biomedical devices, and indeed the dialysis organizations themselves that provide dialysis care, and then the various advocacy groups that are out there and the, the broader media environment. All of these can be important stakeholders to think about when you're constructing your strategy to how to advocate for assisted uh, peritoneal dialysis in your local environment. In thinking about how to make the ask, I think it's always helpful to start with the patient in mind. And as you approach the important stakeholders, critically the ones who are going to fund assisted PD potentially, you want to immediately align with them on what dialysis care options they would want for a family member or a friend if cost were no issue. What, what is the optimal care that we would want for someone in this situation? And if possible, align that with the larger strategy that that funder may have for overall kidney care. The system, the funder may already have an approach to kidney care that may well involve the increase uh, use of home dialysis and peritoneal dialysis in specific. And if you can align on what the best care option would be for the patient, if cost were no issue, then immediately you've made a connection that will naturally lead to discussions around assisted peritoneal dialysis as an important part of care options. Number two, leading on from that, you it's it's then important to establish that assisted PD is practiced around the world, as we have heard from our wonderful series of speakers uh, who preceded me. And it's now supported by a position patient, a position statement from the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis based on really robust published data. So these are important data points to make the stakeholder, the funder aware of when speaking with them. Assisted PD is not something that you are proposing out of the blue. Rather, this is something that's practiced around the world, supported by robust data, and now supported by an international society that looks at these things very carefully. And then number three, thinking about the current local needs in your environment and proposing an assisted PD model that would address your specific local needs. As we heard very nicely from Janet Graham, these models are highly variable. There are many different ways to do these things and your local environment will call for potentially a very specific strategy. In the position paper, we outline uh, the variability of these uh, assisted PD models, and one size truly does not uh, fit all. And uh, the variability spans a number of different lanes, uh, including the geographic scope. There are areas uh, like France where the entire country has access to assisted PD, but others where single center experiences are described. The funding mechanisms are varied. so. 
don't uh, feel that you must get funding from, say, a, a global funder, but you can also look at smaller areas. In my own experience, we were able to get a nonprofit dialysis provider to fund a assisted PD feasibility project. So think about funders be, uh, across different lanes uh, as potential allies and stakeholders for uh, advocacy for assisted PD. As Janet very nicely outlined, the type of assistant varies uh, quite a bit, can range from nurses all the way uh, across various types of healthcare professionals. Uh, the tasks provided can be quite variable. Critically, you'll have to decide for your assisted PD program whether or not connections and disconnections of the transfer set to the peritoneal dialysis tubing are going to be part of the assisted PD program. And there are examples of both models that provide this service and those that do not. Over on the right-hand side uh, in the table four there, we've outlined some of the important other tasks that can be performed by folks who are performing assisted PD. And many of these can be very valuable for patients and their care partners beyond uh, just the connection and disconnection. The number of visits per day, the location of the assistance, and the duration of the assistance, whether this is throughout the course of the patient's time on PD or perhaps time limited assisted PD that's provided at the start of peritoneal dialysis to in, uh, increase people's confidence, as Dr. Oliver outlined, or uh, perhaps for a prevalent patient who has a health event or a care partner who has a health event and temporary assistance is useful to avoid a modality change from PD to hemodialysis. All of these things are important to think about in terms of the model that you you might propose in your local environment to address the challenges that you are facing. As you think about the model, this will then flow into what the net financial impact of assisted PD might be uh, for the system in which you are working. And the local costs and savings are really going to be highly dependent upon that model and the costs of these different items uh, 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 in your local area. So the cost drivers, drivers are going to, of course, include the startup costs, developing policy and procedure, hiring staff, getting things up and running. Uh, it will heavily depend on whether you're going to hire nurses or other types of healthcare professionals, and then the intensity of the services they are going to provide, the number of visits, how long the support's going to be provided for, and the number of patients that you would propose bringing into the model are all going to be key cost drivers. However, you want to look at the net, not just the cost, but the potential savings. And these can include things like, uh, of course, whether or not assisted PD is different in terms of dialysis modality cost to a comparator, say like in-center hemodialysis, but also things that are indirect, such as transportation costs that might be saved by doing assisted PD differences in hospitalizations or nursing home admissions that may be part of this and avoidance of complications like uh, vascular access procedures that might be needed for someone on hemodialysis, which are typically more frequent than the peritoneal dialysis access procedures that are needed for PD catheter dysfunction. So thinking through the net financial impact will be helpful when discussing with uh, funders and other stakeholders around the program. It's not all cost, there's potential savings as well. And each of the different stakeholders is going to have different economic drivers and understanding what those drivers are from your funders, dialysis providers who might be involved, the nephrologists who will be key, and of course the patients and their out-of-pocket costs are all useful when thinking about how to bring a diverse group of stakeholders together to start an assisted PD program, because what works for one may not work so well for another. And recognizing that up front and figuring out compromise strategies or mitigating strategies are going to be helpful in getting to an answer of yes and moving forward with your assisted PD program. So the, the group has recommended that new programs should have an a priori analysis plan to measure the cost benefits of assisted PD. It's very helpful to reassure your funders uh, that this is something you want to do upfront. You've aligned on the fact that this uh, that uh, 
uh, care at home is an important thing, that assisted PD is practiced widely, and you're demonstrating uh, up front that you want to think about the costs very in detail. And you want to include indirect savings from things like transportation, hospitalization, nursing home and missing, and avoidance of complications, and that costing should account for startup costs, the skill of assistance, number of visits, and the duration of support. You can also, as you're thinking about your program, think about how the cost and availability of assistance could be limited in regions by restricting the number of visits or capping the number of patients in the assisted PD program, because getting to an answer of yes may start at a smaller scale and may increase over time as opposed to starting with a fully, fo a fully formed program right at the beginning, although you may be lucky enough uh, uh, to get that going. So uh, in summary, uh, of our assisted PD advocacy strategy, critical to engage stakeholders up front, the diversity of stakeholders that are out there who are involved in the care of our patients on PD, align with those stakeholders on what is best for the patient, in particular with the funder, ensuring that all understand uh, what is best for patients and their families, and if possible, tie it to the larger healthcare strategy, the larger dialysis care strategy that the funder may have. Establish that assisted PD is widely practiced and well-supported, and now there is a position statement from the ISPD that you can use as important backup for your arguments here. Discuss the local needs and a model that makes sense in your local environment for assisted peritoneal dialysis, thinking through the important operational considerations that Janet so nicely outlined. And then look at the net financial impact to the system, incorporating costs and savings, and agree on an upfront a priori financial analysis plan, along with looking at PD in incidents and outcomes monitoring, as was nicely outlined earlier as well. Demonstrate to your audience that you want to look at this program in a robust way, longitudinally over time, to demonstrate that it is highly effective and useful for the patients that you are serving. And then make it happen. Uh, be out there, be enthusiastic, be a champion for dialysis and find allies who can help you to champion this as well uh, so that you can truly move uh, assisted PD forward in the environment that you are practicing. I'll just close uh, with this uh, fantastic visual abstract, which was put together for us by Jade Tikal to summarize the key points from the ISPD position statement on assisted PD. Uh, it very nicely visually highlights uh, some of the key sections that we covered today during the webinar. And hopefully this position statement will truly allow you uh, to advocate for healthcare systems to fund assisted PD to increase more equitable access to home dialysis for the patients that you serve. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and close and hand back to our moderator for any closing thoughts and questions. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Uh, so we have already um, a question uh, that it's a little bit about make it happen and how to make it happen. So Caroline is asking, uh, that they have struggled with some simple mechanisms of, of setting up the, the CCPD program and how, how, which experiences you have. Namely, we're talking about assistant over time. It's a part of full-time responsibility. If uh, going into patients' homes at hot hours, is it safe? Um, do you have liabilities, concerns? I don't know. Probably, Janet, do you have a, an opinion on this one? Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, so I think great questions. Um, so just, I think one of the things you need to think about when developing a program like this is, you know, looking at the your, your home program overall, not like the, as an addition to what you have, because it really does uh, change the mindset. And you really do need to modify some of the other aspects of your program, or ideally to be able to support this. So, you know, I, I think some of the things that you're that, that are mentioned here, like uh, you know, is assistance part of overtime? No. Uh, so what you know, the the thinking really is is to add additional resources to support um, this added care, um, and so you know, looking at changing the role of the nurse or assistants or you know, 
um, groups of assistance within your program to incorporate, uh, you know, whatever you decide. So, you know, I, I'm part of a program that operates 16 hours a day. So that means we have a subset of assistants that work, uh, you know, it, it, the evening shift. We always make sure from a, a safety perspective that there's more than one and person available, uh, that there is someone who is in charge who takes that responsibility. So that gives uh, the opportunity for uh, calls and and questions and things like that. Um, there are lots of programs out there that things like, you know, nonviolent intervention training that equips staff to be prepared uh, for the type of work that they're doing, uh, the ability to access someone else. So uh, often doing home assessments in areas where there may be some concern around safety and putting uh, in place um, mechanisms to try and, uh, you know, mitigate any safety risks always ensuring that your staff have a mode of communication, uh, you know, directly, you know, back. Uh, some programs have check-ins and check-outs so that there is, you know, awareness of where people are. Um, things like, um, you know, in, in the, uh, you, you know, that initial assessment. So trusting your instincts, making sure that your staff are well-trained, that when they, you know, if they have concerns, you know, what are those steps that they'll take um, to contact patients, contact others, uh, to not put themselves, at, you know, in potential risk, but always, you know, also making sure that we're um, ensuring that the patients are getting the care that they need. I hope that answers uh, so, some of the questions. Yeah, that answers. So both of the safety of the professional and of the patient are assured in some way. So, yeah. So... Dr. Bashad, I have just this mean question to, to pose you. You know, when we hear so, such good outcomes, uh, it's $1 million question. So what is holding us back on assisted PD? Well, um, I think, thank you for your question. I think that the, the, the problem may vary depending on where you are. So uh, in many places, I think that the main um, barrier is uh, regarding financial aspects so it's really an important point because of course you will need to pay the nurse who is going at home to perform pd so uh, i know that in many countries um, this problem is not uh, solved yet uh, so i know that uh, edwina brown is fighting for years to have uh, assisted pd in the uk i know that in the usa they have launched an a program to, to provide assisted PD, but only for short, short term at the moment, I think. So it's still an issue um, in several places, I think. Um, maybe another important point is uh, the availability of nurses, because uh, we not always have nurses everywhere to, to provide assisted PD. Uh, we have in, we have in several places a shortage of uh, nurses, so it's another aspect uh, and maybe another um, answer. Uh, in France, the problem is um, maybe a bit different because, as I have said, uh, we have uh, a fully a full reimbursement of assisted PD for for years, and uh, unfortunately, PD is a still. Um, a technique that is not so much used because only 6% of the prevalent uh, dia patients on dialysis are treated by uh, peritoneal dialysis. So despite this availability of uh, assisted PD, it's uh, a technique that it's not uh, so frequent. So uh, it's not a question of a financial aspect. As I've said, it's reimbursed. So um, there are other barriers. The question of nurses and availability of nurses is is um, is uh, one problem. Uh, and maybe also we should underline that the the training of the nephrologist is still uh, an issue, uh, as the number of patients treated by PD is quite low. It's difficult to provide uh, a practical training for the for the resident. So it's maybe also. Yeah a question for, for peritoneal dialysis also. Yes. Thank you so much for this um, 
so bad question that I made. That goes uh, again about you have funding, but who does not have funding? How do they get this PD assisted programs to work? That will lead me to Dr. Oliver. What do you think? How can we, how did you do, and how can we get reasonable and sustained funding for assisted PD? How can we learn with your experiences? Well, one of the things that helped us is we launched it in a formal program. It was actually a grant. So sometimes uh, there's health system grants in terms of sort of innovation. So we positioned it in that. So it kind of had more profile. It was less, well, it was difficult for people not to sort of support it because it was a peer reviewed Ontario funded grant as opposed to just here's a local project. Second, we did limit the region. Um, so we said, why don't we just do it in this region? And since we treated patients in different regions, it actually created a natural control group, which is that initial study that um, Clements uh, highlighted, but it helps kind of create a comparison, which might be quite helpful to say, you know, what is the impact because you have a concurrent control group. It would be better to do a cluster RCT or something, but this might be one way around it. Um, and then uh, we advocated amongst our stakeholders. And in Ontario, we were fortunate that we have an agency which is advocating for renal care in general. So it was kind of uptaked into that region. But I just wanted to give you some sense of it. So the average cost of uh, now with a fully established program in Ontario, it costs about $10 million a year. So the population of Ontario, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is around 14 million. And the cost of renal care in Ontario is around $800 million a year. So, you know, if you think about that in terms of perspective, it's a, it's, it, 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 is, it, is a, it is a significant amount, amount of money, but in the whole scheme of things, it's not that much money. And I, I do think we have to get people to understand that eventually it will have to be funded through regular health care funding, just as PD is funded and HEMO is funded. Um, we not, that's the sort of the eventual goal. Um, so I think people do have to recognize that from the beginning that it's going to cost, it's going to need a funding envelope. However, you know, what do we need to get there and what do we need to show you to get there? I, I think what Graham said was excellent. That was an excellent presentation about ad, advocating. I would really like to know sort of from a CMS perspective in the United States, what would they need to see to fund assisted PD as a regular modality? That would be an interesting question. But those are some of the some of the things we did. You are just stealing my next question, Dr. Oliver. That's exactly for Dr. Avra. What about what are the, the key stakeholders that can help us advocating for assisted PD? So that, that's the key for success, sure. isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think... Like, like many things as nephrologists in care of home dialysis patients, if you, you have a, a home dialysis problem that you're trying to solve, you go and find yourself your excellent nurse. You go and find yourself your, your Janet Graham. You want, you want an uh, operational and uh, uh, expert and nursing expert to be one of your key partners as you begin to advocate for these things so that you can talk uh, eloquently to the operational issues that are going to come up because those are going to be immediate questions that funders are going to have and be skeptical of. Uh, and also it'll, it'll it'll add a lot of weight as you go in and you talk to the frontline staff who you're going to work with to do this. If you have that key nursing and operational partner who can say, gosh, this is how we're going to do it. We can answer these questions about, you know, what times are you going to go? How are we going to keep you safe in the home? What are the key staff uh, that are going to do it? What are the procedures you're going to perform? How are we going to train you? If you have those things uh, with a key partner, as you begin to advocate, that can be uh, incredibly helpful. And I also think, as um, Dr. Oliver sort of mentioned, that it's very useful to be engaged with your national societies that are helping to advocate for these things, because as he very nicely pointed out, you can begin with uh, a more limited uh, funding scope, but eventually the goal is to spread this across patients so that it's widely available. So you want your the backing of your national societies so that you can advocate effectively with those funders. So that's an important group to get on board early and talk talk to them about the program that you're thinking about, the program that you're going to start, and to highlight uh, all of what we've been talking about today, that the ISPD uh, has a position statement on this matter uh, that's backed by robust data from, from many. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to thank uh, you for all your excellent presentations. I hope this is uh, one brick more in our road to assisted PD worldwide. 
I uh, would like to thank your expertise, your knowledge, uh, also the partnership we had in the CCPD position statement. Um, I want to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and just please visit ISPD and PDI websites for the webinar and for the position statement. Uh, thank you for, to the ISN and the ISPD for the organization. Uh, and of course, our esteemed panel of um, speakers today. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful week. Thank you for being here with us.